Good evening, everybody. This is Steve with Real Progressives. Tonight, special night, I have my friend Warren Mosler rejoining us again. Uh, but before I bring Warren in, I just want to say thank you all for being with us constantly, sticking by Real Progressives day in, day out. Um, this weekend, a lot going on in Chicago. The People's Summit will be going on. We'll have tons of coverage throughout the weekend. Also, immediately following this program, Shane Fry will be discussing uh, some events that occurred in Nebraska with the Green Party. And then later on at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, you'll have our friend Zach Haller talking about what's going on in the world today. But without further ado, let me bring on Warren Mosler. Oh, well, I think Warren dropped off here. Hold on. Give us a second here for Warren to return. Oh, it says there I'm on right here. There we go. And let me bring him on. Warren, welcome to the show, sir. Hi. Good to be here. Nice to so let's let's talk real quickly about your governor's campaign in the Virgin Islands. What what is the uh, the mode of operation there? What what exactly is it that your team is telling you, and what is your data saying? Why why are you running for governor of the Virgin Islands? Okay, so I'm running for governor strictly as a matter of conscience. Uh, the way I say it is like if you see somebody drowning and you know how to swim, you volunteer to help. And, uh, you know, maybe they'll select you, maybe they won't, but you volunteer to help and you explain exactly what your proposals are and what you're going to do for the Virgin Islands and, and put it up for a vote. And that, that's what I'm doing. Uh, and I've done it a few times in the past, running for a delegate to Congress down here. Now, I'll be using the same uh, uh, methodology and process that I used last time. Which, okay. Which is, you know, run on the issues. Well, so what, are, what are the issues in the Virgin Islands? What, what are the things that are impacting you in that neck of the woods? Okay, well, the first one is a massive financial crisis, very similar to Puerto Rico, and uh, which, to which I have uh, responses, positive, you know, which are the, what are called Mosler bonds, where the government could issue bonds uh, that will have interest rates of much lower than what they're issuing now. So maybe they could issue bonds at 2% instead of 6 or 7%. And the savings from that plus the reserve funds that it frees up will immediately end the financial crisis. And then we can move on to normal type of governance. We've also got issues here like the uh, Congress has given us our, what is functionally our constitution. It's called the Organic Act, which explains exactly how the gov what the government is and how it runs in the different departments. And all the senators here are elected at large. There are no districts, no individual elections. No senator runs against another senator. Uh, in St. Croix, we elect seven senators at large, and we all have seven votes. So no senator would ever say anything bad against another candidate, because if I'm voting for that other candidate, he wants my other six votes. So it's, it's a completely uh, ridiculous setup. It's dysfunctional. It can't work. And then, of course, they blame us, the victims, for the consequences. And so. We would be going to Congress to ask them to amend the Organic Act to go to some form of districting uh, where senators run against each other, just like a representatives do in the United States, every other state. The other thing is they gave us this impossible constitution and no way to change it. Now, there is an amendment process, but it's complicated, it's intricate, it's been tried five times and failed. The process has failed over 30 or 40 years which is enough evidence to show that it, it just doesn't work. They need to give us a normal amendment process uh, to change this Organic Act Constitution. The way a state does, maybe you have a petition and you get so many votes and then it goes on the ballot and it passes by a majority of changes or something like that. Just a normal amendment process like any state would have, not this silly uh, constitutional convention nonsense that they require us to go through. Uh, what is the similarities? Are, I'm so go, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and there are a lot of other local type issues that are, are not national. One of the things that is MMT related is that, which is important, is that the territories like the U.S. and Puerto Rico, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, we get to keep our own income taxes. We don't have to send the money to Washington. And that's considered an advantage. But when you look at it closely, it's not. It's a huge disadvantage. And the reason is uh, when we send our taxes to our Internal Revenue Bureau, it's Bureau of Internal Revenue, it's called. If we send a dollar in, we get to spend a dollar right here. Okay? But if a state like Florida or Texas sends a dollar into uh, 
uh, Washington, Washington spends a dollar twenty-five back into the states. So all the money still gets spent back into the states, but the federal government runs a budget deficit, which means they spend more than they tax. And those are not anybody's taxpayer dollars. Those are just accounts credited by the New York Fed, right, to uh, make the payments. And, no, and, and so that money is not anyone's taxpayer money, the federal deficit spending, which will probably be over $600 billion this year. And we're not getting our per capita pro rata share of those bonus dollars created by the government, presumably to you know, support the entire economy. And nobody's even considered that. If you look at that lost funding for the territories, uh, when I, I spoke to the uh, man at the New York Fed who covered Puerto Rico, was his, he did the country reports of Puerto Rico, and explained it to him. I said, look, I think if you do the econometrics, this will explain why the territories have uh, incomes approximately uh, on a per capita basis, half of that is the states. He said, look, I don't have to do the econometrics. I can tell by just looking at it. You're absolutely right. And so this is another critical point um, to have the territories, you know, come on a par with the states uh, economically. That, that describes the, the differentials and why they don't do as well. It's like a country that's dollarized, like Panama. They're not going to do as well as any of the states because they don't get their share of federal deficit spending. And I'm not saying Panama is entitled to it, but you know, we're part of the United States. We're U.S. citizens, U.S. territory, U.S. passport. There's no difference except we don't have a voting Congress because we're not large enough. And uh, Congress did not buy the Virgin Islands or obtain Puerto Rico to run it into the ground and show the failure of capitalism. The idea was to, to, to show that, uh, you know, how the United States works. And we've left out this important feature. Now, when I've talked to individual congressmen about this, they completely agree with me and say, yeah, you need to, let's get your representatives together on this. And, you know, we'll make the adjustments. So, um, so that, that's another part of one of my proposals and why I'm running Okay, so let's talk about Puerto Rico for a minute. You know, yeah. do they have, is, is there anything that they themselves can do without the help of the federal government to actually get themselves out of the trouble there? And are they in a situation that requires the federal government to bail them out straight up? No, right now, and I, I've proposed it there. I've been over there several times. They, too, can issue what I call Mosler bonds for Puerto Rico. They can refinance their entire debt at the whole $60 billion at very low rates, maybe a lot more plus 100 And uh, the crisis is over. And they, they understand it. They won't do it. And I've spoken to a lot of parties there. I've spoken to people in Washington. And there's no public answer to why this isn't happening. Um, I think it's, there's a, an aversion to the lenders. The people who have bought Puerto Rican bonds, they want them to pay. They want them to, like, take larger haircuts. And I think they're holding the whole country hostage to trying to punish the bondholders. Now, you know, when you look at it, you know, what did a bondholder do? What did the teacher's retirement fund of, you know, Ohio do wrong when they invested and bought Puerto Rican bonds that everyone was promoting as safe investments or whatnot? And they got their... Four percent or something. I mean, these aren't like criminals or anything. Now, I, um, now maybe they sold them to some hedge fund, and the hedge fund's manager has a big mouth and you know, and, and said something bad against Donald Trump. I don't know. You know, I don't know the politics behind the whole thing, but I, I talked to enough people to know that there's something they're not talking about, and it, it, by omission, it's they don't want the lenders to receive full payment. So, if they did something like what I did. What I propose, which is to refinance the bonds, have all the money at a lower interest rate, and pay off the bondholders, uh, they, they don't want that as an outcome. And, and that's my best guess right now. And, and even then, you know, they've already negotiated some kind of a discount. They wouldn't be paying them off the bar. It would be 70 or 80 cents on the dollar. Or uh, I think they just want more. So they're going through this bankruptcy process, hoping to get steeper discounts with the lenders. Meanwhile, their population is paying them. You know, serious price. For this. How how does a individual that lives in the islands how do they expect their um, life to be for the most part? I mean, are are most folks down there expats, and what is the the way the uh, you know uh, the population breakdown is? Is it mostly affluent, mostly impoverished? 
How does that play out? U- U.S. Virgin Islands? Yes. I think the per capita income, is tw- last I checked, the figures aren't that recent, twenty seven or 28000 a year, which is three or four times the Caribbean standard, so it's considered good by Caribbean standards, roughly half of U.S. standards. So it's not considered bad. The unemployment rate isn't as high as you might think uh, because people leave and go to the States. So everybody here is a U.S. citizen, U.S. passport. They can all go to the States and get jobs there. So it's it's you know, a little bit maybe like Hong Kong in that respect. Unemployment doesn't get all that high because people go back to China. Type. At least that's the way it used to work. So, uh, and the same with Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico's lost half a million people. So whatever the numbers are, they would have been a lot worse if people didn't have that option. So it's, it's about the people gravitating to other parts of the states. And there are probably more Virgin Islanders, I know there are, living in the states than there are here. And there are more Puerto Ricans probably in the states, maybe two to one than there are in Puerto Rico because of that process. So, And the whole fiscal exclusion process I just explained, plus what's going on with this financial crisis just drives that dynamic even more. Is, is this, is this very, very similar to um, like the Greek situation, given the fact that they are no longer in control of their own currency and, and they're, or is this very, very different because it's like, I, I think this is a question that goes around an awful lot. Yeah. People consider the U S as a possible, you know, hey, we could become like Greece. Um, it's profoundly not true, but can you explain what the circumstances are and the similarities between Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Greece? And, um, it's and pretty do- much the same thing. It's pretty much the same thing, where you depend on Washington for fiscal policy that you know makes sense, and if they don't come up with it, you pay the price. And, and Greece depends on the European Union that comes up with a fiscal policy, a series of fiscal transfers, uh, you know, that makes sense. And if they don't, you, you pay the price. And in the U.S., we've had, uh, at least presumably, a more mobile population where people can you know, move to Texas when energy is booming and then they move to New York when Wall Street is booming, that type of thing. So you get, which you don't get as much in Europe because of the language barriers and cultural barriers. And so, uh, so the U.S. has been a more liquid place, if you want to call it that, for people moving around. I'm not sure people actually want to do that. And it doesn't have to be that way. You know, the jobs can be where the people are, especially today. Everything's virtual. Absolutely. So, again, it depends on public policy. So public policy has been to force migrations from state to state, from territories back to the states. And that's that's ongoing. And public policy in Europe is forcing people from Greece to other areas and uh, you know, that's still ongoing. They haven't done much to address that at all. So Giannis was out there, um, has been frequently uh, speaking about uh, universal basic income. And now you've got Zuckerberg running around saying we need a universal basic income. I think you even had Elon Musk saying such a thing. Um, MMTers are on the record as saying we'd like to have a federal job guarantee. And then some are even going with what they're calling a jig or a, a job and an income guarantee. Um, what, what is your take on the uh, universal basic income in terms of its relationship uh, to a stabilizing uh, public policy? Is, is it, why, why the job guarantee over the universal basic income? Okay, so I'm not, I'm not categorically against basic income. Okay, and um, so what, what you have is you have to look at what, the, in the first instance, this monetary system is all about. It's about government uh, desiring to provision itself. People decide we want a government, and there's going to be a military and a legal system and public education or whatever else is going to be in there. And, uh, and so how do you get people out of the private sector into the public sector? So what you do is you impose a tax, and think of a head tax or a property tax just to keep the this discussion simple. And the tax isn't something nobody has. It's the U.S. dollar. The dollar becomes the tax credit, the thing you need to pay taxes to not go to jail, to not lose your house, to not lose your car, you know, be a good citizen. And so the purpose of the tax is to create something that wasn't there before, and that is what we call unemployment, people looking for paid work. Okay, so before there was a dollar, there was nobody. Before there was a tax in dollars, there were no dollars, there was there were no people looking for jobs to get paid in dollars. It just didn't exist. And 
So the government wanted to be able to spend its, what I call, otherwise worthless dollars to provision itself to get people out of the private sector and public sector. So the levy's a tax. That creates sellers of real goods and services who want dollars in exchange. And then they show up for work. They go to the Army. They get 40000 a year to be in the Army, plus food stamps, whatever else you get. And then uh, they're federal judges and they're educators and everything else, politicians. And so, and then the government pays them, and then those dollars are used to pay taxes. And the cycle is complete. So if you put this tax on because you want to provision yourself and you want sellers of real goods and services, then you simply give everyone enough money to pay the tax. Well, you're back where you started from. There are no sellers of goods and services for dollars anymore. They're getting them for free. Why would they go to work for the government? And you can't provision yourself. And it, that condition is called hyperinflation by some because there's no price you could pay in dollars to get anybody to work for you. The southern states could not start paying Confederate dollars now to provision themselves because there's no tax payable for Confederate dollars. But if they did put a property tax in Confederate dollars on, on their residents, then they could get people to work for their governments for Confederate dollars. But if they just gave them the dollars to pay the tax without having to work for them, they, they're right back where they started from. So basic income is giving the economy the funds to pay the tax, which threatens the ability of the government to provision itself. It, it, it reduces the, those seeking paid work, which we also call unemployment, of course. And if you don't, if it's not large enough where it doesn't completely eliminate the, you know, the tax liability, well, then, then you can still function. It's okay. And it's, it's, it's in a complex institutional tax structure like we have today, it might be simpler and it might be a more progressive solution to give some of that. You know, you got this complex tax structure in place. The economy needs the money to pay the tax. It's, 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 we're grossly overtaxed for the spending that we do have as a government. So we have two choices, either increase public spending or reduce the tax liabilities. And if you want to reduce the tax liabilities in a progressive manner, part of that might be to um, have a certain amount of basic income, which would be a, and do it progressively. But you've got to be very careful. You can't be you know, a full living wage for anybody who wants it because then you're going to wind up paying too much and, and the whole monetary system. And, and the appearance will be a hyperinflation. So, I, again, I'm not categorically against it, but I'm just trying to point out the dynamics of what it is so it can be understood before you do it. And it's a, you know, there's a lot of risk in something like that because it, it gets put on by people who don't understand it. It's the, the risk of a mistake is fairly high. Now, I don't use the word job guarantee anymore, by the way. I use transition job. And number one, the public sector should properly provision itself with the help it wants. It should just have more people because there are more people looking for work, and so you feel sorry for them and you put put them on the public, uh, you hire them out of that, you know, permanent full time jobs. The government decision to provision itself, how many people it wants in the military, is not rightly a. The monetary system doesn't tell you anything about that. If you get more people in the military, you're going to have fewer farmers or fewer automobile workers or fewer teachers or fewer healthcare researchers. You're not going to cure cancer as quickly if you have more people uh, in the legal system and in the, you know, than, than cancer researchers. Okay, so what you're doing is you're shifting resources from the private sector, to the, and that is a cost. Jobs are a cost, not a benefit, and so you determine how many you want. You have a tax structure in place. If you produce more than you wanted. And they're, as evidenced by all the unemployment, they, you know, that just says the tax system structure you have in place has created more unemployment than you want to hire as government. Um, you either got to hire them, change your mind and hire them, or somehow reduce the tax structure so that they go away. Well, <clears throat> if you decide you don't want to hire that many people and you do want to reduce taxes or increase benefits somewhere else, I. Uh, You've got another problem, and that is the private sector doesn't hire people who are unemployed. It wants to hire people already working. So there's got to be a means for these people to be able to transition from unemployment back to private sector employment. And that's what I call the transition job. You offer a full-time job to anybody willing and able to work for the purpose of transitioning them back to the private sector. And they will. this will happen. Okay? And it's the wage you pay 
I'll call it a minimum wage job because by definition, no matter what you pay, that will be the minimum wage in the economy because anybody can get that job. So there, no one else could pay less and, and hire people away with lower pay. And so you've got a, by definition, minimum wage transition job for anybody willing and able to work. Then you measure the size of that pool. If it's too many people, it's deemed too large, more than frictional, which might be two or three percent of the, of the labor force. It means your fiscal policy is too tight, and you either increase public services, increase public benefits, maybe Social Security benefits, or reduce taxes, depending on your agenda. Now, I've got you know, proposals on how to do that, but I'll leave them out for now. And so, this transition job is critical to to transition people from unemployment, which is created by government policy, uh, back to the private sector when government realizes its error, mends its ways, and uses um, you know, rational fiscal policy. Have I, have I droned on too long for you here? Not at all. I'm not okay. at all. I do want to ask you, because um, you know, there's several flavors of, you know, obviously there's not a proposal out there right now that's physically being pushed by anyone other than the one that John Conyers pushes every year. Um, but I know that the Levy Institute and Pavlina have their own version of a proposal. Um, there's other people coming up with varying proposals. Um, some of them are more permanent. Some of them are more socially, artistically geared uh, towards serving what we'll call the public purpose. And yeah. then others are more transitional in nature. Um, ultimately, at this point in time, I think that for the average American person, you know, we're looking to, to not have to struggle in the sense, not no struggle. That's not like, oh, my God, I want my life on easy street. The idea of being threatened with complete and utter destitution um, is, is very, very difficult to grapple with. And, you know, for some of us that have experienced the downturn, especially during the crash, a, a transitional job or a different flavor of job guarantee, anything like that, would have been life-saving for many, because from what I'm understanding, many, many, many thousands of suicides happen every yeah. year as a result of unemployment. So, Steve, look, let me say, this crash was caused by a you know, a total failure of government policy, right? And what you're saying is there's things government could have done to, to not have a, such a failed policy. And I completely agree with you. You know, this is not like a failure of the private sector. This is a failure of government. First of all, that has to be recognized. It's not, it wasn't caused by banking greed or anything like that. You always have that. This was caused by you know, policy failure to respond to what was going on in the private sector, which couldn't be easier. They could have done an immediate, you know, a full payroll tax holiday, eliminated FICA back in August 2008, July 2008, when we were proposing that. And then you wouldn't have had the collapse in sales, and 8 million people wouldn't have lost their jobs. And they would have kept making their mortgage payments in the bank. There would have been no bank bailouts or auto bailouts or anything else. And the problem with bank and auto bailouts is they don't do it until after the problem is so severe that, uh, you know, it's irreparable harm and damage that's been done to people's lives. We live in real time. And you're just taking away that people's time, you know, and replacing it with this miserable experience that still hasn't gone away for, look, how, how many votes would Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump have got if the economy was as good as... Uh, president was telling us, right? They wouldn't have gotten any votes. Exactly. It, Warren, I want to tell you, you know, you, you, we've talked numerous times, obviously, and, and you're one of my heroes. And for me, as, as we sit there and talk through this stuff, I, I think I even told you, I mean, like I wake up every morning feeling like there's lives on the line for this knowledge that we're trying to share out there. Yeah. And when you look at your, you ran for Congress, I believe it was in Connecticut, 2010, yeah. 2010. You made a bet with with anyone that would take it. Yeah, well, I made I an think, offer. I made an offer. An offer of a hundred. Go talk. Tell us about the offer you made. Yeah, I offered a hundred million dollars to anyone who could prove I was wrong. You know, with the following statements. I can't even remember what they were, but it's like the government can't run out of money. It's not dependent on China for spending. All the all the headline rhetoric that was going around at the time about why, you know, we needed tight fiscal policy at a time. 2010 when we needed exactly the opposite and you know no one took me up on it which is unfortunate um, uh, I, I could not have made the payment at the time let me put it that way <laughs> it was a bit of a bluff. 
but uh, I was pretty sure I wasn't going to have to make the payment. I could have, I might have been able to make payments over 20 years or something if I had to. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, but the, the point though is, and, and nobody puts up a, an offer like that, right. even if they could have, nobody puts it up unless they're pretty God bless and sure. That yeah, I know what it's, you're talking about. It's published in the Huffington Post and it's still there. Absolutely. I, I, we've shared it numerous times because okay. even though we can't necessarily back up your hundred million offer, we can show that we're not talking like just errantly and just running around saying things. I mean, the fact is, is that our country, our lives, our our world, quite frankly. I mean, you look at the work of the Ben Zager Institute and the things that they're pushing around. You know, federal job guarantee. They're looking in developing nations, etc. I mean, there are things we could do today, right now. That would really, really, really unscrew our lives. It's yeah. so easily, and they're easy. They're easy solutions. I'll give you an example, and I know you're going to love this because this is yeah, your word. Yeah, let me add one thing. Sure. It's not about adding a stimulus. It's just about removing restrictions, right? So it's not like you get something for nothing. You just print money. We're talking about removing a restriction. And I use the example of a runner who's Olympic runner, well trained, but he's got a plastic bag over his head. He can't breathe. So when you remove the bag, that's not giving him drugs. That's just removing the bag, removing the restriction. So these things you're about to talk about are things that remove restrictions. You're not talking about some something for nothing, you know, magic thing happening. So you you are famous for the ZERP or zero interest rate policy that yeah. literally eradicates the need for debt, et cetera. Talk about ZERP for a minute. Okay, so I'm not sure where to start, but... Well, you know, let me let me guide you so that I can see. Anyone who starts with a currency with a clean sheet of paper doesn't, you know, doesn't involve bonds and interest and all that. That comes from fixed exchange rate policy where you have to do that to protect your reserves. But if you don't have reserves like the U.S. that, you know, backing the currency, you don't offer convertibility, then th that's all moot. It's, it's entirely inapplicable. But we're doing it anyway. So, it, you know, a clean sheet of paper monetary system would just never do that. The, the, the debt, you know, that we hear so much about is really the net assets of the nation going back to the beginning of time, the untaxed dollars, et cetera. It, even, that, even simpler, because I gave with, with Stephanie when she was working for Sanders, I gave her two responses that you had to have for any question about the debt. First of all, the public debt is just the dollars spent by the government that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. And they sit there in bank accounts at the Fed called Treasury Securities. So, like, what's the problem? Okay, and that, that's the first response. And these are just the dollars spent that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. You know, so, like, what, what's the problem? And if there was a problem, don't you think it would have happened before $20 trillion? Or maybe $19 trillion or $1 trillion? <laughs> 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 I mean, how could this be a problem when you're at 20 trillion and nobody even knows <laughs> absolutely I, I this this is this for me i think is really important warren because you know we're not dealing with you know these the as much as i fall my, find myself falling down on the left hand side of a lot of social issues etc th this isn't a left right thing this is about how do we get things done and right now, people like the Pete Peterson Foundation, et cetera, uh, you know, have a lot of left-wing love, by the way, which is amazing to me. But these yep. folks have created such a schism, such a, a fear-mongering uh, about the debt and deficits and so on and so forth, that it, it, it ties in intrinsically to our natural uh, look at our own bank accounts. We, we panic, et cetera. So when you raise the idea of ZERP, as a way of eradicating so many of the ills that the the other side of the coin that the banking conspiracists etc look at I mean, it, it's like almost as simple as Medicare for all you just change a couple dates you know from zero to infinity and you've the, got the government. Yes, the government again the government's created this problem by issuing treasury securities they don't have to do that this is a problem is created by government. It's not a natural thing for man to do or the private sector or anything else. It's entirely a problem created by our own government. And all we're saying is like reverse this institutional damage that you've been, you know, put in place and, you know, and are oppressing us with. Just stop it. 
is causing a large portion of the income distribution issue. It's all, it's all like bad government policy. So you and I have uh, talked about this before. You don't use the term, you know, taxes fund spending because fund could mean a lot of different things and it creates confusion in some and some play a semantic game that ultimately ends up back to the same answer regardless. But yeah. the fact of the matter is, is that we don't use taxes are not there to pay for items. Government checks don't bounce, as you say. Talk to us right. a little bit about that concept. Yeah, so there's no, um, you know, the government can always make any payment it wants because how does the government make a payment? If you actually look at the Fed, if you see what they do, and they're just changing numbers and accounts. When Chairman Bernanke was asked where the money was coming from for the banks, is that taxpayer money? He said, well, no, we just use the computer to mark up the number in their accounts. Now, that was not some special operation. That's all there is. Okay, so there, there's, it's all it's, it's all it's always ever been. It's all it's ever been, uh, and it's all it can be. It's a scorekeeping system. Uh, it's like if we're in a card game and I'm the scorekeeper, how many points do I have? Like, I don't have any points. Well, then if you have a good hand, how do I give you 100 points if I don't have any? You just write them down and you, under your name. That's your account, right? And so uh, there's no restriction on government's ability to make a payment. Now, whether you, you know, I don't want to get any semantic into any semantic argument, so I just say it that way. There's no dispute when you say it that way. Now, the other interesting thing is, um, which we discussed before, if you were to pay your taxes with, you know, a bunch of old $20 bills, the government would take your money, give you a receipt. Thank you very much for funding the last airstrike in Syria or whatever they did with the money. And then they, that money goes to, they send it out the back door to a contractor, but it goes into a shredder then you can buy bags of shredded money in Washington. Okay, now, I don't know anybody outside of government who would do that. If I bought your house from you for $200,000 and paid you in all 20s, you're not going to go shred it. <laughs> okay? Now, if the government bonds, sells bonds, they're going to sell $5 billion worth of bonds. And I, you know, I was a waiter at the local restaurant here and kept all my tip money and cash. And I went and bought the $5 billion worth of bonds with a bunch of old 20s. They would give me the bonds. They would pay interest on it, give me my money back when they came due. But, you know, and I would pay them with these $20 bills. Well, as soon as they got the money that they borrowed and paid interest on, they throw it in the shredder. Okay. Now, again, that's not what households and individuals do when they borrow money. You don't go to the bank and borrow a million dollars to buy a business and then throw it away. Okay. So clearly there's something else going on here. Now we do know places in the private sector that actually do this. So you've got, you know, you go to the football stadium and you buy a ticket to the Super Bowl and it's a thousand dollars, and you, now you've got a thousand dollar ticket, and then the game's going to be a good game, and you sell it to somebody else for five thousand, they sell it for ten thousand. Now this ticket's worth ten thousand. They walk into the game, give it to the guy at the door. What does he do with it? He tears it up and throws it away. Okay, why would he throw away a ten thousand dollar ticket? Well, we all know why he does. See, it's used up. It's at the end. You know, the the, the stadium you know sold it. You got it. Turned it in, it's over. Okay. It's the same thing with the dollars. They're the government's tickets. They spend them. You know, they want you to work for the government. They put a tax liability in place. You go do the work. You get paid. You pay the tax, and they throw it away. Okay, so clearly there's something very different anyway going on between government and households, if nothing more, you know, than evidenced by the fact that they take this these funds and throw it away. Now, what if you pay your taxes by check? What do they do? Well, all they do is change the number down in your bank account. It's exactly the opposite of what they do when they pay you. When I get my Social Security check, $2,000, direct payment to my account, my account balance goes up by $2,000. If I had $5,000, i have got $7,000. But what do I have? I have a screen in front of me where the five changed into a seven. It's not like some pile of gold or dollars got dumped into a bag somewhere. And then if I pay a $5,000 tax, my seven gets changed into a two. The government didn't get anything. There's no gold coin fell out into somebody's lap or uh, <laughs> money was moved around from one account to another. Okay, So it's, it's just scorekeeping. It's, but it, it, it's not taking away from the importance. We're just talking about that narrow element of the whole thing. Government is not restricted in their ability to make payment. It doesn't diminish anything they have when they make a payment. 
you know, physically like a pile of money or gold. And when they collect taxes, they don't have any more of anything that they use to make a payment. Now, it does. These both of these acts have make profound differences to the economy, taxing and spending. But it's not about running out of money or, or anything like that or insolvency or turning into Greece like you spoke before. I want to use a quote from Stephanie Kelton from about a year ago, um, and I want to get your take on it because I think this is very, very awesome. She did a tweet, um, and I'll just read it. It says, Congress will authorize spending, that's in quotes, is the correct answer to every quote unquote, how will you pay for it question. I love that. It's so simple. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I get it. even more simple. How do you pay for it? We, we credit the account of the appropriate you know, member bank at the Fed. We change the number up in their bank account. That's, that's what we do. You know, that's how it gets paid for. And why? there's no pushback on that. That's just it. But the, 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 I think the question always comes in. Uh-oh, we lost your audio. Oh, are you still there? There, I hear you now. Okay. So the, the question always comes up because, you know, it goes back to that term fund, uh, which we're going to try to to work with here for a moment. You know, when, when I've asked others, they've said Congress is the only one that can authorize new spending. And, and therefore, when you ask who funds it, I mean, right, wrong, or in different term, the point is that Congress authorizes it through an act of Congress. I mean, by so, by so it's spending rather than funding, right? It, exactly. For a lot of people, funding implies you're getting it from somewhere, and so uh, whether you, if you're going to use the word funding or fund, I, I would carefully define it first. It's like using the word money. You probably don't hear me use that very often, except very casually because uh, of all the different definitions. You, you either have to carefully define it or just say what you mean. So I'll say we you know, add dollars to bank accounts rather than that we created money. I, I just don't say it that way. Understood. So yeah. think, uh, we're losing your vocal again. Okay, you there? Yes, I hear you again now. Okay. So when we talk about money, and I think this is a good point, we, we were talking about uh, what was it the Buckaroo the last time you talked? And then Stephanie right, right. did a, a video on how to create a currency and so forth. And we've talked recently on our own programs about how coupons at the local grocery store are, are a form of money and stamps are a form of money. And yeah. they're all like IOUs. There's something you're getting at the end of the rainbow for it. And, right, but look, you're defining, you're defining money right there. Exactly. And there are people who not define it that way. So, I'd rather use terms that are already, you know, clearly defined if I can help it, you know, if I have a choice. Absolutely. Understood. And I think that um, the analogy of, of the buckaroo and chase bucks and, you know, the giant bucks, if you will, dollar off at McDonald's or any number, you know, of places, it, that is a form of this. So I, I guess the point I'm making is, is that those are... Convertible currency, so is it convertible into some commodity like a hamburger or something like that, exactly. as opposed to tax credits? So the the what we generally consider as money, if I can take a guess as to how people define it, are uh, tax credits. You know, things that can be used for U.S. taxes, which are dollars, yen that can be used for Japanese taxes, euro which can be used for European taxes. So we're, th these things are tax credits. They're not convertible into some commodity or something. like that. Very good. Excellent, excellent description. All right. So, Warren, I, I guess the next thing I want to talk about, and this is a big thing for the people that watch our program, we all feel the pressure of the election cycle. Um, I know our MMT is not a political system. It's not a movement. It's not any of the above. It's a description of what is. However, what is isn't what's taught either in the mainstream media, in our colleges, in our high schools, our politicians lie about it constantly or they're ignorant and they don't know any better one or the other either way. It still leads to death, ironically. And, and so as we go into this next election cycle, you watch the people that are already falling in love with candidates that have not even announced yet, et cetera. They're already trying to back horses. And I say, well, hold on. Don't be, a easy, don't be the easy one at the bar. 
know your value, hold out for a minute, right? Let wait for a more suitable, you know, suitor to come get you. And and when you think about it, these people, I'm, I'm not hearing any of them actually speak about an economic strategy founded in macroeconomic reality. Not one of them. I'm not hearing any of them, not even, not Bernie, not any of them. And you've had, you know, how can we better bubble this up and push that, push that narrative up faster. Some of us are not looking to wait 40 years and you've been doing this an awful long time. Any, yeah. any suggestions? Well, what, you know, if I can win this race for governor, then I think I'll be in a position to get some national attention and promote a progressive agenda, promote a real economic agenda that uh, makes sense for everybody. Because I'm not sure any of my proposals have not made sense for pretty much everyone. I mean, can you think of any that, you know, that, that have been like, uh, that don't make sense for either the left or the right? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, they, this is the, we had Mike Norman on the other night, just as a point of reference. Yeah. How's he doing? He's Our next doing great. It was one of the, one of my, one of the most. Uh, Steve, you, told me there was no, you told me there was no candidate without a good economic agenda. Well, we got Mike. I lied. <laughs> I lied. And, and yeah. that's the beautiful thing, right? Is that I, I, I'm, I'll be honest in my mind. If you are not MMT, knowledgeable if you're not pushing yep. macroeconomic truth in the message you have i consider you to be a liar not just yep. not just yep. like not a good candidate i consider yep. you to be a liar because there's enough information out there there is enough opportunity out there to learn these basic truths if you hold on to every newspaper every one of these people i consider them to be a liar and quite frankly i consider them to be a murderer by proxy because people die the poor die because of their ignorance. When so I Mike's, heard him, Mike Norman's problem is guilt by association because yeah. he's, a New York, he's a New Yorker. So he's got <laughs> Trump, Clinton, Sanders, you know. I mean, how many New Yorkers are we going to try here? So he's got that. But other than that, you know, he's got a lot going for him. I, I was so thrilled to hear so much of what he said. I mean, I think that people, if they understand the, the radically large coalitions of people we could pull together, leveraging a knowledge of MMT, because first of all, it speaks to the right wing's need to not have taxes jacked to the roof. It speaks to their need to be able to not believe that they're actually paying for someone's bad decisions. And on the yep. flip side, it allows the people that are hurting and suffering that feel differently to be able to survive and thrive. I see this as the win, 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 life-saving truth. And, yeah, well, and the thing is, People aren't, in general, well, the people you're talking about, they're not suffering because of anything they did. That'd be blaming the victim. They're suffering because of bad government policy. And we're talking about removing the restrictions that are causing that suffering. And that's where the whole idea of a crime against humanity comes in, whether it's intentional or not. This is not the natural, you know, scheme of things to have these things going on in the, you know, in the world or in the United States or the rest of the world. These are, again, just deliberate government policy. It, it makes no sense to me at all. I'm, when, when you listen to the Diane Feinsteins of the world and the Nancy Pelosi's of the world who are absolutely adamantly opposed to any of the policies that we put forward and you listen to the politicians act like we are somehow or another in this debt strangle. And I'm not talking about the Paul Ryans of the world on the right. I'm talking yeah. about the friggin' Democrats. Yeah, I know that. It's it's unconscionable to me that they even carry any kind of left wing credentials at all. But more importantly, that they carry any kind of credentials to begin with, because they they're literally charlatans across the board. I, I don't get it. I have no concept of how what they're selling is being bought by anyone. Yeah, well, if I can say this on the air here, yes, you can. Uh, there, there is a word for them. I just forget whether it begins with a W or an H. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you what, Warren, we, we are watching this weekend in particular is, is a really big weekend for, um, you know, I, I hate to say it like this, but it's kind of like the, 
the Dem enter progressive stretch run where they're trying to infiltrate the party with Nina, uh, Nina Turner and, and uh, a bunch of the other ones. Bernie will be there and so forth. But this is one year that was very disappointing to me. I, I, I'm not there. Um, and, and neither is Stephanie Kelton, who was there last time. Um, yeah. and, and then just yesterday... You've got all the promotional materials out there of the Sanders Institute. Now, I know some people have issues. I'm not going to get into them. They're not. They're irrelevant to me. But Stephanie being there and Robert Reich being there, I, I mean, I get it. They were part of Bernie's team, but I don't get it in terms of nothing Robert Reich says in any way, shape, or form gets us there. He's a lot of the same old, same old of people with their fist in the air with no pathway to the future. Stephanie's the only one of that bunch that really has the understanding of how to guide the train, you know, through the tracks in the dark. Yeah. What do, what do we got going on there? I mean, it, it's very, it, it's it's a bit maddening to me, quite frankly, and I'm sure it probably yeah. bothers you too in your that's, own way. That's that's like, um, you know, a critical inroad. Whether, you know, hopefully something comes of it, but those are the inroads that sooner or later I think will break through. Absolutely. So when, when you look at that, what is your understanding? How do I say it? I want to say it delicately, but I want to be to the point. Maybe, why, maybe to dispel it. <laughs> why, why is it so difficult for us within that ranks? I mean, Bernie has to know. He spent plenty of time with Stephanie. Robert Reich has to know. He spent plenty of time with Stephanie. I mean, and there's others that were a part of that pack, and they have been in the same circles. How is are, are they just petrified of the voters? Are they are they scared to death to speak truth? Are, what what do you think is blocking them? I, I think I only met Bernie Sanders once, but I think it's just too hard for him. Too hard have, for him. And and, and and Reich is the kind of guy that uh, is been surrounded and bombarded by what you'd call monetary cranks for a long time. And he's not in a position to like sort this one out. If somebody's going to have to do it first that he looks up to, and then, then he'll move in that direction. He can't do it on his own. Now, do you think that Robert Reich is in any way? I mean, I don't know whether you have any inside knowledge on this. Or not. Do you see him being open to this at all? Or do you think he's just, this is my shtick. I do it three times a week, Mondays, Fridays, and you know whatever. And you know I do my dog and pony show, and that's that. Or do you see him being open to shifting the the, the way the game is played? Because it, what he says he wants and what he preaches are not in any way, shape, or form simpatico. They don't they don't line up. It, we would be waiting a hundred years before we got green energy or anything yeah. else. I, I guess in line with that, I was just saying he. He can shift more than Sanders, maybe, but it's going to take, but it'll be with time. It's not going to be done quickly. It's, it's not going to be on impulse. He, he's had conversations with Stephanie. He's had a brief email exchange with myself, inviting him to discuss and put out a few key issues. And then he just goes silent on it. But uh, I think he's waiting to see if it stands the test of time or, or if it gets dismissed by somebody else. Because uh, I don't think he trusts his own ability to decide whether it, it does make sense or not. Well, what about Krugman? I mean, Krugman is, I consider him to be a charlatan at this point because he absolutely knows the truth. He's been beaten over the head with it countless times. By, and I've seen the exchanges. There's no escaping it. It's like one minute, if Trump's in office, he's completely and utterly against any deficit spending. And then if Obama's in there, he is 1,000%. It's okay to deficit spend. The man's a yeah. crank for sure. What do you? It, it, what is his modus operandi that keeps him trapped in this, this whack-a-mole world that he's in? Yeah, at this point, you can only say uh, intellectual dishonesty. <laughs> That's exactly it. I mean, I, I, like I said in the beginning, I would call him just plain old a liar. Krug, yeah. Krugman is... Per, you know, public enemy number one, because what he's done is he's sidled up to the uh, to the Democratic Party. He's won a Nobel Prize or whatever Pulitzer, or whatever the hell prizes he's won. They're about as worthless as as you know a, a gold wrapped chocolate bar. And you know, I don't understand why he's celebrated the way he is. 
But here yeah. you've got a guy who's got the New York Times backing him. He's on every radio show, every talk show. He's paraded around like, you know, like the second coming. And he, he is absolutely offering zip in any way, shape, or form that provides hope to the average man. Nothing he peddles in any way helps humanity. I, I've yet to figure out anything of substance from the man. More importantly, he's just wrong. <laughs> yes, he is just wrong, indeed. So, all right. So, in these last few minutes before we, we get going, I, I want to ask you one more thing. Um, in your, you were on a Green Party panel debate with uh, AMI, and yeah. you also had the public banking world. And anybody that watched that witnessed, first off, a, a first class gentleman in yourself and somebody who had total command of the subject matter. Why is it that these alternative theories that really are founded in religion, in my opinion, not necessarily any kind of operational truths, why, why do you suppose that they are so romantically uh, you know, connected to many of the people on the far left? What, why do you suppose that they would jump to that versus... It, it, I don't understand it. I really don't. Uh, no, it might be a matter of some of their credentials, but you know, you could see in that discussion, whatever it was, they're just, they just will not engage, period. And so you know, they stick to their own narrow talking points, rhetoric, as disconnected and as illogical as it might be, they just keep repeating it. Uh, and I guess there's some people who like their conclusions, and so they s stick with their analysis just because they like their conclusions. Well, it, you know, it, it drives me a little crazy because, like, you know, and I'm not asking you to, to co-sign what I'm about to say, for truth be told. But, like, someone like Richard Wolf, he's got a lot of things that he probably gets right down the road. But he, in my opinion, Richard Wolf is a, is a religious guy, you know, an economic religious guy, and that he has created a doctrine, and then the supporting facts have to match the doctrine as opposed to the supporting facts creating the doctrine – He's worked yeah. it backwards. And, and I see an awful lot of that on the left, people that have this desired outcome, and then they look backwards and try to make the facts line up to equal that. And, and as somebody that wants to achieve many of the things they do, I have found MMT has made me more I mean, knowledge of this to, to the degree that I have it. I have found it has made me far more left-wing just because the, the concerns that I had as a former Republican – were assuaged with the entire understanding of how the monetary system works. It, it seems like a natural proclivity to become a human being once you understand MMT. <laughs> it's, it's like the perfect yeah. antidote to remove the idiot and add humanity to the person. Why? Yeah, and I, th I think in an important way, it's also the, um, uh, I don't know, I, I call it a libertarian uh, outlook. You know, like almost, you know, way beyond the libertarians, the so-called libertarian, the headline libertarians. I think the MMT outlook is 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 a libertarian, almost um, almost at source. Okay, because the source is, you know, why do we have a monetary system? How did we get here? We decided collective action had value. We decided that we needed government, and now we're figuring out how to provision it. And we use a monetary system. And so it comes down to government is there for public purpose, for public infrastructure. And then you decide which public purpose, which public infrastructure you want. And I think that's a um, inherently as libertarian as there is. I mean, that's like, the, I'll use a bad word, but I'll just say a true libertarian position. Uh, and so um, you might decide you don't want any collective action. Fine, that would be an extreme libertarian position. You might decide you need military or police or legal. That would be, you know, less extreme libertarian position. The libertarians don't think you need stop signs for the roads. Cars will figure it out. That's fine. But the idea is you're discussing which items of public infrastructure support public purpose. And then once you've got that established, then you go ahead and fund it. So, uh, you know, I think it covers, uh, I think there's something highly, you know, deeply libertarian about the the whole understanding in the, in the analysis. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny because, you know... Soft, that's the word, I guess, yeah. 
well, being being someone that flirted with Ron Paul for a while back before I understood MMT, yeah. um, you know, I found the the entire uh, narrative ridiculous once my eyes were open. And I remember watching people fighting with the Mises gang and and so on and so forth, going deep into enemy territory. <laughs> but yeah. the idea here is, is so logical. You know, this this conversation, quite frankly. We shouldn't have to have it. We should be able to have discussions about what we want our country to be. And this should just be a known. It should be a given. It should be a constant, so to speak, in right. that, you know, this is it, MMT just is. So let's move on. But sadly, the mythology and the conspiracies and the insanity and, and sadly, the, the, the worst. I used to think Republicans were the worst. I used to think Democrats were the worst. I am coming to find my very own progressive community is like hell bent on peddling the worst of the conspiracies. They make Alex Jones, you know, pick up the phone and say, hey guys, I want my conspiracy back. I mean, I, I have been blown away by some of the crackpot stuff coming out from my own team. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's unfathomable how easy, you, without knowing all the deep, deep, deep layers of the system, just on the surface, just having a base understanding of these things, Warren, should inform them enough to know that without all the bullshit, we can have a really, truly wonderful governing structure. We can have a great existence with very, very little knowledge of this. They just need to know that our government is nowhere near broke and that government checks don't bounce. There you go. Absolutely. All right, Warren, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, I appreciate it. Tomorrow night, I'm going to have David Cobb join us um, here shortly in a moment. We're going to have uh, uh, our friend Shane Fry reporting out. And then right immediately after, you'll have Zach Haller joining us. So with that, Warren, I want to thank you one more time for joining us again. I look forward to having you back soon. Okay. Sounds good. Good to be here. Bye, Steve. All right. Have a great night. Bye-bye.